terms of losses of soldiers, it's the worst day in British military history. And, and the loss of life is, is huge. It's a, it's a story of development. It's the beginning of the, of the wearing down of the German army beyond the point where it can recover. My name is Dr John Greenacre. I'm a part-time lecturer in history at the University of Suffolk. Um, outside of the university, I work as a battlefield tour guide and academic support for military uh, continuing professional development. So I've spent a lot of my time on the battlefields, uh, including on the Somme. I used to be in the army. I left the army in 2011, and that's about the time I started working at the university as an occasional lecturer and then I moved up to become a part-time lecturer in 2017. When most people probably think about the Battle of the Somme, they're thinking about the first day of the Battle of the Somme. So the 1st of July 1916 was actually the Battle of Al Albert, part of the Battle of Albert. The Somme um, goes on for a, another 147 days into the middle of November after that um, and he's sort of split down into, uh, into um, various phases that each have their own individual battle names, quite a lot of them do. So you have the Battle of Bazantan Ridge, you have the Battle of Mermet's Wood, you have the Battle of um, Pozier and there are others, they'll come to be um, as we go on and collectively they're known as the, as the Battle of the Somme in 1916. Uh, but it tends to be that first day that people concentrate on and if you go to the battlefield a lot of what you can see there now and what has been set up for visitors um, revolves around the 1st of July 1916. And the reason being it is clear is because in terms of losses of soldiers it's the worst day in British military history. So on that first day, and to be quite honest, probably during the first few hours of that first day, from 7.30 onwards up till midday on the 1st of July, um, the British Army um, takes around 60,000 casualties in round figures, of which around 20,000 are killed in action in round figures. So um, uh, that's, that's the reason why people um, uh, tend to focus on it, and particularly on the 1st of July. Not. On an individual level and for the families involved, it, it's a tragedy, obviously, for some towns and communities that, um, that sustain a lot of losses because of the way the, the, the regiments and battalions are formed. It, it's a tragedy. It, it doesn't achieve its aims in most areas. And, and the loss of life is, is huge. And the story of the rest of the battle, in my opinion, is, is, far more, is far more interesting because it's a story of development from that point on, how the British Army begins to develop at that stage, how it begins to refine tactics, how new equipment begins to make a difference, all the way up until mid-November when the weather really intervenes and the bulk of the large-scale fighting begins to um, grind to a halt. There is fighting that continues through the winter, and although traditionally the Battle of the Somme ends on in mid-November, uh, there is a case for saying that it continues through to February 1917. Um, uh, uh, the British Army had to expand extremely quickly and to, and to a very large extent at the beginning of the war. To take a significant part in the war, it was recognised very early on that it would need to expand very quickly. So that begins to happen at the end, uh, well, from August 1914, really through to sort of the end of 1914. Millions of men volunteer to join the army. 
But it takes some time for the, those men to then be trained and equipped and be ready to fight a battle. But by the time you come to the Battle of the Somme and the beginning of July 1916, a lot of those men recruited in 1914 are now ready to take their part. Many of them the first time that they're going to go into battle. The first day of the Battle of the Somme is a British and a French battle. They're fighting side by side. The British part of the front line that the battle's going to take place on is about 14 miles long. And taking part on the first day, there are going to be around about 140 British infantry battalions. So a battalion should be about 1,000 men. Uh, they aren't always up to strength. So a lot of those soldiers, about half of them on the first day, are from these new battalions that have been formed since the beginning of the war, um, full of men that uh, less than two years ago were not soldiers uh, and have no real experience of battle. And the commanders planning the battle are aware of this and they know that these men are going to need as much assistance as they can possibly get. And so the assistance that there um, is planned for them is, first of all, a very um, or what's considered at the time, a very uh, extended and heavy artillery bombardment. During the week before the battle, um, around about 1,250 um, guns are going to fire about 1.75 million shells um, into the enemy's front line and his supporting trenches. And the second uh, thing that's going to assist them is the, the commanders realise that um, really the plan is going to have to be kept as simple as, uh, as possible to allow these new battalions to, to cope with it and to stand a, a fighting chance. Um, because it's not just the soldiers, it's a lot of the officers as well who uh, have no experience of battle. Uh, the whole front line is going to move at the same time, at 7.30 in the morning. 7.30, um, when we think about it, is not the best time to attack because um, at that time of year, uh, the sun comes up at about four o'clock in the morning, half past three. These men are all going to be waiting to go over the top and go into battle or may even still be manoeuvring into position when the sun comes up. The Germans are going to have a chance to observe what's going on and there's going to be a warning that this battle is taking place. The Germans have also been bombarded for a week beforehand so they know that something's um, up. The artillery bombardment stops with about two minutes to go before 7.30 so that shells don't fall on the British troops as they advance. That two minutes is enough to give the Germans a warning that the attack is about to begin allows them to come out of their dugouts, find what's left of their trenches or find craters, set their machine guns back up. These heavy machine guns, they can fire over a mile and still do damage. And the countryside of the Somme is very rolling. The Germans are on the, top of the, on the tops of the hills and ridges mostly. Uh, and so they can fire across fixed lines. They can see a long way. They can see the troops advancing in the daylight um, as it is by then and it has a devastating effect. And then the Germans begin to call down their own artillery into no man's land. So as men are being either cut down by machine gun fire and hit or they're taking cover, then they've got the problem of German artillery. As the first men get up, they are told that they should um, move forward at a steady pace towards the German trenches, which again sounds, sounds crazy to us, but um, if we think about it a, a bit more deeply, uh, these men are carrying quite a lot of weight um, for a start, all their normal equipment, their ammunition, grenades, but they're also carrying equipment to, um, to allow them to prepare the German trenches for defence when they get there. So they're carrying shovels, um, they're carrying empty sandbags, they're carrying metal pickets with them. So they're, they're carrying quite a lot of equipment. So for, for a start, running, Diving for cover, getting up again is a difficult thing to do. Uh, also, there's a chance of injury if you, if you try and do that. So you don't want to get to the German trenches and, and already be worn out because that's when the fighting begins. Also, you don't want, um, you need the, um, your soldiers to arrive there together. Um, because if they arrive in dribs and drabs, they'll be, they'll be picked off. If the faster men get there first, they'll be picked off. So you need everyone to arrive together, and that means moving at the speed of the slowest person, and so you, you get this move forward at, at a steady pace, which looks and sounds uh, crazy. Really, the story is from the beginning of the day where people are reasonably hopeful that this huge attack has been laid on, all this artillery, 
Soldiers going into the battle for the first time, probably quite reasonably buoyant, reasonably confident, although with a bit of trepidation. By the end of the day, it's clear that along most of the front line, not all of it, um, but along most of the front line, that the attackers um, absolutely failed. No progress has been made at all. And, um, and these huge casualties have been sustained as well. Okay, so what we've got here in front of us is an array of uh, copies of original documents, um, all of which pertain to the Battle of the Somme in 1916. Some are official, some are personal, and um, they span across British, um, French and, uh, and German documents. And I just want to pick a few out that will help us um, to see the span of the Somme from the 1st of July 1916, certainly on uh, through to mid-September um, 1916. And we can start um, really with the conception of the battle um, with this uh, letter here, written by General Haig, the commander of the British Expeditionary Force in, in France and Belgium, and written back to the Chief of the Imperial Staff, essentially the um, military head of the army um, in London. Written on the 1st of June, and in it he talks about a meeting uh, with French commanders down at Verdun, where the French were fighting uh, an extremely large protracted battle with the Germans and the French felt that um, they couldn't hold at Verdun for much longer and that they required a large battle somewhere else to draw Germans away from Verdun to, to relieve the pressure and that's essentially the beginnings of the um, uh, of the Battle of the Somme. So it's initially planned um, and this is sometimes lost in the stories about the, uh, the Somme from, from a British point of view. It was planned as a, as a Franco-British um, a battle at the point where the French and the British armies uh, joined, uh, were next to each other. So that was the original um, plan. It, it was due to take place at the end of June, was slightly delayed because of, um, because of poor weather, um, essentially. But before the attack could, put, um, to, could take place, um, the Germans renewed their effort on Verdun, and a lot of the French troops that had originally been scheduled to fight on the Somme uh, had to be taken away, so in fact had the opposite effect, had to be taken away um, to reinforce Verdun. And so the Battle of the Somme, when it does take place, um, has a greatly uh, increased, in proportional terms, British effort than the French effort. But there is still a, a French part of the Battle of the Somme on the 1st of July 1916 at, at the south of the line, um, and, and that, that, that part of it uh, tends to get tends to get glossed over uh, and forgotten about. Um, but, but that's what this letter shows. It, it shows the, uh, the very beginnings um, of the Battle of the Somme. And then if we move to the 1st of July itself, um, we have an official report here from the 2nd Battalion, the Gordon Highlanders, um, an infantry regiment. So the, if you draw the shape of the Somme front line on the 1st of July before the battle, uh, on a map, it, it looks a little bit like a hockey stick. And at the bottom of the hockey stick um, is where the Gordon Highlanders are, really on the curve of the hockey stick, where there's a, um, villages called Freecourt and Mermets. And this letter mentions um, the village um, of Mermets um, and the Gordons fighting uh, there. It also mentions the uh, battalions to the left um, and the right, and particularly on the left, it mentions the 9th Battalion, the Devonshire Regiment. And we can still see traces of these battalions if you go on to the Somme today. And this report is really indicative of what we tend to think about when we think about the first uh, day of, of the Battle of the Somme. It talks about men being held up by the barbed wire and, and casualties being taken through German machine gun fire and through, um, and through artillery. Um, and it tells us the numbers as well. Um, and, and it's the numbers that really make for the grim reading on the 1st of July 1916. So at the beginning of the battle, uh, the battalion strength here, it says 24 officers and 783 other ranks. So a, a little under strength for an infantry battalion. At the end of the day, seven officers killed out of 24 and 119 other ranks killed out of 783. And wounded a further nine officers 
and 285 other ranks. So all in all, casualties, killed and wounded, we're looking at a, um, more than 450 out of um, 800 in the original um, battalion. So huge casualty rate, 50% casualties, essentially during a few hours at the beginning of the battle. Um, and, um, and that's certainly not um, by any means the highest casualty rate. Next to it is a little item um, that talks quite a lot about some of the issues, not just on the 1st of July 1916, that, but that hamper the British Army in particular, but also the, the, the German Army on the Somme, and that's communications. During this fighting on the Battle of Somme, a little over 100 years ago, communications were still very crude. There were no radio communications to talk of at the time that could be easily carried in battle. When you were sat in defence, as the Germans were, you didn't have such a, a big problem because you could put in fixed communications, you could put in cable and, and run telephones. The problem came once you began to advance and then trying to take your communications with you. So you could take telephones with you and lay cable, which people did during the battle. But of course, cable is very vulnerable to uh, artillery fire and to mortar fire and it gets broken and you lose communication. So there had to be other means of communications. Uh, and this little card and instructions is for semaphore soldiers, how to signal using semaphore. Uh, so communications is a problem on the 1st of July and it's a, it's a problem that dogs, particularly the British Army, because it's trying to constantly advance throughout the war, although it does improve with technology as, as the war goes on. Next object that we will move on to is this sketch map here. Um, drawn by a battalion of the East Surreys for their attack on the 1st of July 1916. So at the bottom it just sketches in very lightly um, their trench line and then it shows the German trench lines that they're due to assault um, up the roads, um, uh, the run up towards a village called Montauban, um, fighting uphill as usual towards the, the village and the road that runs along the ridge uh, at, at Montauban. So this map is good at illustrating the fact that not every, everything was doom and gloom. It's very difficult to get over the fact of 20,000 dead and 60,000 casualties, but there was some success. And the reason why that success came down uh, around the southern uh, area of the Battle of the Somme is varied. Um, uh, th there were some mines detonated there, some huge flamethrowers called Livens, um, uh, long gallery flame projectors we used. One of the main reasons is because those divisions fighting down in the south could call on the French artillery to assist them. And the French artillery was generally uh, of a lot larger calibre and heavier than British artillery and, and could disrupt the German defences to a much greater degree. So from there, if we move on from the 1st of July then, because it's, this Battle of the Somme isn't all about the 1st of July, then we come on to these two documents here. And uh, these documents are, um, are what's known as a war diary. Every battalion, uh, every uh, brigade, every division above them kept a war diary day by day throughout the time they were deployed during the war in France, Belgium, Gallipoli, Mesopotamia, wherever they were. And quite often like this one, not just day by day, but al almost minute by minute, reporting what goes on. Now this is a brigade war diary from the 20th Brigade of the 7th Division um, and it uh, relates to the, four, uh, to the 13th and 14th of July 1916. So we've moved on two weeks from the first day um, of the battle and what this diary helps us understand is how the British Army then developed and progressed beyond the 1st of July 1916. So even in those two weeks, when they launch an, another, um, another attempt to push forward in an area, again, near Mametz, and they changed a lot of what they'd done on the 1st of July that they realised had not worked. So rather than launching the attack at 7.30 in the morning in daylight, they launched it at three o'clock in the morning while it was still dark. They moved forward from their own trench lines during darkness to cut down the distance uh, to no man's land. They didn't carry all the, uh, all the heavy equipment, the initial assaulting uh, troops. The artillery preparation was different, so it didn't give the fact that the attack um, was about to, uh, to happen, didn't give it away. 
Uh, and because of all these changes um, that had taken place and that were put in place for this battle, um, it, it was very successful. And, and we can read the progress in this war diary here of battalions moving forward, making quite quick progress. And from three o'clock in the morning, really around about midday, um, officers are, are reporting um, that all the objectives have been taken. So although we see progress, things still aren't uh, absolutely perfect. There's still, still progress to be made there um, in mid-July. Then we'll move on to a group of documents here that take us forward a little more. So another war diary and these two message sheets that sort of go together. So they all um, belong um, or relate to the 15th of September 1916 and another phase of the Battle of the Somme, which is called the Battle of fleur Courcelles. And the Battle of fleur Courcelles, its main reason for being significant and remembered um, is it is the first time in history uh, that tanks are used um, in battle. So tanks have been developed in great secrecy by the British, um, uh, partly through um, interventions and, and assistance from Winston Churchill, They've been developed back in, in Great Britain, practiced with, trained with, and the people that have begun to develop them have really seen that the way to use them is en masse, a lot of them together as an as a, as a instrument of shock, uh, essentially. But what always happens when the military develop new technology um, is that there's always a push to use it as quickly as, as possible. And so tanks were, were pushed into battle too early, really, to assist at the Battle of the Somme. They weren't there in great enough numbers to make a real difference. Um, so less than 50 tanks um, were used. They were extremely unreliable at this point, towards the end, in the autumn of 1916. So out of the um, less than 50 that were originally um, uh, put forward for the battle, only about half of them actually got beyond the start line before they broke down. Uh, they did, but they did have an impact. Um, they did come as a surprise to the Germans, that they shocked the Germans and they pushed them out of their defensive positions. This is what's recorded in this war diary here and from these messages here. Um, and the fact that it's well known that messages were sent saying that tanks were seen um, rolling down the high street of the village of Fleur. And we can see the evidence of that uh, there and individual um, officers reporting in in the war diary um, from their original tanks and their tank numbers uh, um, being noted here, uh, D12, uh, D11. Um, and here as well, these messages that have been uh, sent from the tanks. Now obviously, I talked about um, communications earlier, how difficult it was. Uh, without radios, communications from tanks is even more difficult. You can't really lay cable from a moving tank and, and use a telephone. You can't uh, do semaphore from a tank because you're obviously in a, a large uh, metal box. So the options for communications are very limited. These, these messages were sent by pigeon. Uh, so pigeons were carried inside the tanks. Um, messages would be um, written out, folded down into in, into uh, uh, into small uh, uh, packages so that they could be attached to the pigeon. Um, a little round uh, cover was opened up on the tank and the pigeon was poked through it and, and off it flew. And it would fly back to general um, headquarters, hopefully, uh, and make it there alive, at which point the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the messages could be read and progress could be uh, judged. Uh, and these messages talk about tanks again. Uh, moving from Longueval to Fleur uh, and, and being in, in Fleur and the tank being abandoned. Because tanks still at the time were very vulnerable. If they were hit by artillery fire, the, 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 the metal on them was actually not that um, thick or protective. They would break down, uh, they would uh, get stuck in trenches and, and ditches. Um, operating them inside was extremely unpleasant. There was a crew of eight inside a tank. The engines were inside, the exhausts were inside, they were hot, they were unpleasant. When the guns fired, the, the fumes from the guns firing came inside the tank, the hot cases ejected inside uh, the tank. 
you couldn't see where you were going, it jolted around, you'd feel seasick in it. So they're extremely unpleasant things to operate. They're not particularly reliable at the time, but the main thing at the time is that the, the tactics to use them really haven't been developed and, and that will take some time into 1917 before effective tactics between infantry and tanks are, are developed and they become a useful weapon of war rather than a, a novelty. So this, the, these documents here take us through to September um, and, uh, and, uh, and beyond that through the, this battle of September, although the battle continues in, into October um, and into November, um, the, the gains after Fleur Corselet are not, are not so significant. It's eventually the weather um, that, that shuts the battle um, down. Um, for some reasons that are obvious, it rains more, the ground becomes more muddy, becomes more difficult to move around, uh, it becomes colder, Troops don't operate so well in the cold, um, but less obvious um, reasons as well. Daylight gets shorter. It's very difficult to fight at night during the First World War, so you lose the amount of time you've actually got to conduct useful operations. And horses need feeding. All the armies run hugely on literal horsepower. And as the winter comes, the forage isn't there. Essentially, you have to put your horses on rations to a certain extent. Uh, and if you're not feeding your horses fully, you can't expect them to do that their full scope of, of work. So all these factors really mean that th throughout the First World War, fighting more or less stops in a large organised fashion when you get to about November and then generally starts again somewhere around April. Uh, and that's what happens on the Battle of the Somme. There are cases, uh, there, are, there is a case um, um, uh, which uh, is being looked at at the moment for perhaps pushing the Battle of the Somme on into January and some of the minor uh, actions that, that happen beyond November into December into January and possibly into February. Um, but the official date for the end of the Somme uh, is, is, is the 14th of November uh, 1916. So I think that's where we will um, uh, we'll leave this interesting collection uh, of documents that can tell us uh, so much about uh, the Battle of the Somme. Going back to my first point, I guess, um, the reason why it, it tends to get remembered is because of that first day of the Somme on the 1st of July 1916, the, the heavy casualties, the, the worst day for the British Army in terms of casualties. So, you know, in terms of remembering that, that is a significant reason for remembering that day uh, and the beginning of the Battle of, uh, of the Somme. If you look at the outcomes in terms of um, gaining ground, taking enemy territory, not a huge amount is gained really. When you look at a map, um, it doesn't look significant. There's no breakthrough. And in fact, the line that was drawn for soldiers to get to on the 1st of July, in some places that line still hasn't been reached by the middle of November. Uh, so in those terms, um, but what's important is, um, is the amount of damage done to the German army. Uh, during the Battle of the Somme. And the Somme, the Battle of the Somme is the beginning of that. It's the beginning of the, of the wearing down of the German army beyond the point where it can recover. So, so that's why it's significant in, in terms of the, the outcome of the First World War.